Everybody knows that it's virtually impossible to make it as a professional athlete. It's an occupation reserved for the 1% of players who suit up for their respective sports. With the NBA, it's no different. In fact, to even make it to the league, you have to be the 1% of the 1%. If there's anything harder than making it to the NBA, it's having a lengthy career where you're making meaningful contributions to whatever team that you're on. There are so many things that go into being a productive NBA player, and talent isn't even half of the equation. Some things are out of your control, like getting lucky or getting into the right situation at the right time. Fortunately, there's a route that these guys can go that allows them to make a living as a professional athlete, and that's going overseas. Dozens upon dozens of prospective NBA players have gone that route and seen lavish success, one of which is the subject of today's story, Pierre Jackson. Quick disclaimer, Pierre Jackson has traveled all over Europe. It's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but I need to preface this, I need to preface that by saying this. Because he gallivanted across Europe, there are gonna be some instances where I fail to properly pronounce the names of the clubs that he played for. So I'm just gonna throw that out there. When you guys inevitably see me struggle, just know that I had to go to howtopronounce.com to figure out the ways of pronouncing these places and I still don't even know if I'm saying them properly. But with that, let's get back to the story. Born in Las Vegas on August 29th, 1991, Pierre Jackson didn't really put anybody on notice for the early parts of his basketball career. However, the young guard managed to make a name for himself locally despite not attending a powerhouse high school. Jackson spent his formative basketball years at Desert Pines High School in Vegas, a relatively large school that isn't known for its athletics. The only other person under the notable alumni section of their Wikipedia is Julian Jacobs, a fellow professional basketball player. Despite a stellar senior season that saw him land on Nevada's All-State first team, Jackson was unable to make waves in the recruiting trail and didn't draw much attention from the larger Division I programs. He was an unranked recruit across the board, and that came in spite of him showing that he was a lethal scorer and a capable playmaker. And as a senior, he scored more than 700 points and led the state of Nevada with assists posting upwards of 250. With little happening on the recruiting side, Jackson went the JUCO route and enrolled in the College of Southern Idaho. His stint was short, but the Vegas native extracted the most of his time in the Gem State. He led the College of Southern Idaho to, a, to an NJCAA title in 2011 and also brought home Player of the Year honors after averaging 18.6 points and 4.4 assists. Showcasing a penchant for making things happen all over the basketball court, both the media and the NCAA began to shift their attention towards the diminutive point guard who was making noise in the Northwest. 247 Sports ranked him as the 18th best Juco recruit in the class. However, some felt that Jackson had made the case to be the best player in the pool. Of course, Jackson assessed all of his options for his basketball future and ultimately decided to attend Baylor University. The Bears were coming off of an 18 and 13 season and their best guard, Lace Darius Dunn, was moving on from the school after completing his senior campaign. Additionally, Baylor lacked a prominent facilitator, which Jackson mentioned to magicvalley.com shortly before he signed, saying, quote, Baylor needed a point guard pretty badly last year. I guess I was the perfect guard for that situation. And boy, he turned out to be more than perfect. Pierre Jackson's NCAA debut came on November 11th against Texas Southern. It was a modest debut where he recorded eight points, four assists, and three steals. His next outing was almost identical. Instead, he put out three assists instead of four. Shortly thereafter, Jackson found his groove. He had six double-digit scoring efforts on the bench and got hot right as conference play was on the horizon. It seemed that almost every time Pierre Jackson touched the ball, something would happen for either himself or his teammates, and that type of play is difficult to ignore. It was so difficult, in fact, that he used it to catapult himself into the starting lineup, overtaking the spot from AJ Walton. In total, as a freshman, Jackson started 20 games and averaged 13.8 points and 5.9 assists for a Baylor team that finished the season with a 30-8 record. During March Madness, Jackson elevated his play and averaged almost 18 points 
and seven assists. Unfortunately, Baylor fell to that Anthony Davis-led Kentucky team in the Elite Eight. After seeing what went down in Waco the previous season, folks across college basketball were excited to see what Pierre Jackson would do as a senior. In the Big 12, voters went ahead and named him the Big 12 Preseason Player of the Year, and he even drew national notoriety by landing on the preseason watch lists for both the Wooden and the Naismith Award. Contrarily, people were not as optimistic for Baylor as a whole. The team saw three of their best players, Quincy AC, Quincy Miller, and Perry Jones, all decide to leave the school and try their luck in the NBA draft. And losing that type of produ production, it's difficult to offset that despite having a strong incoming freshman class. Baylor landed at 19th in the preseason poll and everything just went downhill from there. Overall, Baylor finished 23 and 14 and were just nine and nine in conference play. Their failure to improve on the previous season basically crushed their hopes of landing a bid in the NCAA tournament. And I just, I know that was a crushing blow for the seniors, especially Pierre Jackson, who had done everything in his power to keep the team afloat and to keep them competitive. He wound up leading the conference in both points and assists per game, averaging nearly 20 points and seven dimes. He also finished fourth in steals and connected on about 36% of his threes, just for some good measure. Although I'm sure that Baylor would have loved the opportunity to compete for an NCAA title, there is a little bit of a silver lining. Their above average record allowed them to compete in the NIT, where they went on to beat Iowa in the championship game on the shoulders of, you guessed it, Pierre Jackson, who finished that game with 17 and 10. With his collegiate career over, Pierre Jackson set his sights on the NBA draft. Now, I know that draft reports can get quite extensive, so I'm going to keep this as concise as I possibly can. Jackson was a supremely talented shot maker and shot creator. He was dominant in the pick and roll and an absolute menace from the perimeter. Upon watching him, NBA coaches could see everything that they wanted in a possible franchise point guard. However, there was one thing that they couldn't overlook, and unfortunately, it was something that, again, was out of Jackson's control. It was his size. I've managed to go this long without outright mentioning Jackson's height because it wasn't necessary. His stature may have contributed to him not being heavily recruited out of high school, but that could also just be the result of scouts not going to a like relatively unknown school in Las Vegas, especially when there are other spots that they can go to. At any rate, it didn't really impact his play. It wasn't seen as a negative in high school or in college, but in the NBA, being short is a tremendous liability and Jackson measured in at five foot, 10 inches tall. Whether it was generous or not, Jackson 99 times out of 100 was always the shortest player on the court and it was considerably it was it was considerably noticeable however he did manage to offset that by being a freak athlete and also by being significantly stronger than most of the guys at his position and of course there was his skill set which was super hard for everybody to ignore outside of his decision making there weren't any other major concerns to summarize the previous paragraph jackson had the talent to compete at the NBA level, but his size was going to make finding a role very difficult. Even so, he heard his name called on draft night when the Philadelphia 76ers selected him 42nd overall before ultimately trading him to the New Orleans Pelicans. Remember how earlier I mentioned that two keys to an NBA player success are luck and timing? Well, Pierre Jackson's NBA career got off to a rather unlucky start because with the Pelicans in 2013 he competed with them in the summer league however he failed to reach an agreement with the team because they just had too many guards on the roster we're looking at guys like Drew Holiday Tyreek Evans Austin Rivers there was simply no spot for Jackson on the roster consequently Jackson packed his bags and flew over to France after signing with Asvel Villiers-Ban I'm pretty sure I nailed that so a little little clap for myself however 
he left the team before even appearing in a game for them to come back to the United States to deal with some personal matters. Now back in America, Jackson's path to the NBA continued with the D-League's Idaho Stampede, who drafted him fourth overall in the D-League draft. To say that Jackson dominated would be an understatement. This dude straight up cooked everybody in the D-League and finished with averages of 29 points, 6 assists, and almost 2 steals. During that stretch, Jackson dropped a then-record 58 points and was naturally selected as a D-League All-Star. It was abundantly clear that Pierre Jackson had game. I don't care what league you're playing in, if you're averaging 30, you're one of the better players in that league. And the same is to be said about anybody who can go off for 58 on a given night. It's just an incredible feat, especially for a guy in the D League. Like you could look at that type of talent and think, why isn't this guy on an NBA roster? Like it's it's almost just it's so unusual but unfortunately pierre jackson would still struggle to get to the nba for a couple more years despite cooking the d league like they were a ribeye jackson yet again had to continue his professional career over in europe this time signing with fenerbahce Uker of the turkish basketball league however he had yet another short stint and appeared in just six games with the team and averaged just 3.3 points. After that, he hopped on another plane to the United States. I sure hope that this man was enrolled in some type of rewards program because the miles that he was accumulating are just crazy to think about. It was now the summer of 2014 and Jackson found himself in yet another summer league this time with the team that had drafted him, the Philadelphia 76ers unfortunately in his first game with the team just seven minutes into action he sustained an achilles injury that was found out to be season ending jackson would be on the sideline for six to 12 months as he rehabbed this achilles injury the sixers were kind enough to give jackson a partially guaranteed contract to help him along during his comeback but they ultimately waived him later that year still fighting to prove his worth to an NBA team, Pierre Jackson again appeared in the Summer League and again suited up for the Philadelphia 76ers. In spite of being sidelined for an entire year, Jackson came back and looked decent. He managed to stay on the Sixers roster through the Summer League and also for a couple of preseason games, but ultimately the partnership was not meant to be and he got waived again. Shortly after being waived by the 76ers, Pierre Jackson returned to the Idaho Stampede, where a little bit of rust was still evident. He averaged 9 points and 2.5 and assists, which are modest numbers for most players in the D-League, but for a guy who averaged nearly 30 and 6 the year before, he was a far cry from being that player. Since the EuroLeague had been kind to Jackson up until this point, he shifted his sights on signing with yet another team over there. He settled on Croatia and ultimately signed with Sedevita, who was the easiest team to pronounce while writing the script. I did not have to look at anything. It's kind of just, you look at it and that's how it is. Unless of course, someone from Croatia wants to correct me because it's very possible that I still messed up that pronunciation. Anyway, back to the story. Sedevita offered a contract that was just one month long and Jackson, who was still only 25 at the time, accepted and proved that barring injury wherever he went his talent followed he went on to average 20.9 points and six and a half assists for Sedevita over that month now up until this point jackson has been to idaho texas his home state of vegas also to turkey to croatia and france what is that that's seven destinations on his trek toward the NBA. He grinded for what felt like forever, trying to build up his reputation and also prove his worth to an NBA team. And during the 2016-17 season, Pierre Jackson would make his debut, his long-awaited debut with the Dallas Mavericks. However, it didn't happen that quickly. The Texas Legends acquired Jackson in November of 2016. He played 10 games, and it was at that point where the Dallas Mavericks approached him with a contract 
and he was officially a member of the team. Being in the right place at the right time is probably the most prevalent theme throughout this story. If Jackson hadn't landed within the Mavericks farm system at the beginning of their rebuild, it's tough to say if any other team would have reached out to him and tried to sign him. To put it diplomatically, Dallas was pretty below average during the 2016-17 season. They were bracing for life post Dirk Nowitzki and acquired Harrison Barnes hoping that he would be the next franchise centerpiece. He was decent, averaged about 19 points and 5 rebounds, but overall, Dallas lacked the talent to be competitive and finished that season 33-49. and 49. They weren't the worst team in the West, as I said, they were a little bit below average, but it was clear that they were just beginning to embark on their rebuild. Among the Mavericks' problems was their lack of a standout lead guard. Rick Carlisle's backcourt rotation consisted of Wesley Matthews, Yogi Ferrell, a 32-year-old Darren Williams, Seth Curry. All of these guys had respectable individual seasons. I believe all of them averaged like anywhere from 11 to 13 points per game. But again, nobody stood out. Nobody separated themselves. And perhaps Jackson who was just coming off a couple of fantastic seasons over season in the G League, would be that spark plug that they were looking for. Jackson got a pretty kick-ass belated Christmas present when he debuted for the team on December 27th. The then 9-22 Dallas Mavericks took the court against a James Harden-led Rockets team, and they got the brakes beaten off them, with the final score being 123-107. All 10 minutes and 35 seconds of Jackson's playing time came in the fourth quarter, and things went things went pretty good for him. He had a decent showing and finished with 7 points and 2 assists. Over the next month, Jackson made 7 more appearances with Dallas and even started a game against the Oklahoma City Thunder. Unfortunately, he wound up leaving that game a little bit early after suffering a hamstring injury. In total, Jackson accumulated 35 points and 19 assists in 84 minutes. He also committed just three turnovers in that span, leaving his most displeasing stat to be his abysmal shooting percentage of 33.3%. Jackson's production with Dallas was modest, but it wasn't quite good enough to earn a guaranteed contract for the remainder of the season. The Mavericks proceeded with Yogi Ferrell at point guard, who at that point had put together a decent run in the D-League and would ultimately average about 11 points and 4 assists in 36 games with Dallas. After being waived, Jackson returned to the Texas Legends and finished the campaign with them. When it was all said and done, he averaged nearly 23 points and 8 assists in 28 games. With a few more bullet points added to his resume, Jackson hopped on another flight to Europe and signed with one of the EuroLeague's most recognizable franchises, Israel's Maccabi Tel Aviv. In 50 games split across two leagues, Jackson averaged about 13 points and 4 assists, and although Tel Aviv struggled in EuroLeague play, Jackson really, he, he really stood out. He averaged 14 and a half points per night, which was good enough for seventh on the EuroLeague's leaderboard. Now, keep in mind, the EuroLeague is a slower paced league that doesn't really cater to high volume scores. If I remember off the top of my head, the league leader in points that year was, I think, Alex Alexi Shved, who averaged right around 20. So putting up 14 in the EuroLeague is like averaging 22 or 23 points here in the States. Overall, his numbers were good enough for him to be named an Israeli League All-Star, and he was also a part of the team that brought home the Israeli League title. Pierre Jackson's campaign with Tel Aviv that season was arguably the best all-around of his career, and he used it as a springboard to go to where pure scorers like himself go to satisfy the non-stop urge of getting buckets, China's CBA. The CBA is a league that in recent years has become increasingly popular and increasingly famous because of its ridiculous offensive performances. And there have been dozens of standout collegiate players, former NBA players who have gone over to that league and experienced lavish success. In short, it's a spot where guys shoot 
like they're getting paid by the attempt. Someone like Pierre Jackson, who was a standout college player because of his scoring ability, it seemed almost like a no-brainer for him to go over and sign with someone like the Beijing Flying Tigers, which is whom he ultimately decided to sign with. The, the partnership seemed to be ideal, and I think it was more idyllic than anybody could have imagined. Jackson laced his kicks up for Beijing for the first time on October 21st, 2018, and had a 46-point debut where he shot 70.4% from the field. And that was not even him scratching the surface of his potential. Not even a week later, Jackson had a 67-point performance against the Shenzhen Leopards. He shot 18 of 26 from the field and absolutely cleaned up at the free throw line going 21 of 24. Arguably though, the most impressive stat were his 10 assists. While this man was out going crazy offensively, he managed to set his teammates up 10 times. And all of it was for naught as Beijing suffered a crushing one point loss. Shortly thereafter, Jackson had another 60 point performance, 63 to be exact, and also finished with, just hold on, also finished with point totals of 58, 54, 51, and 50. There were also seven instances where he scored anywhere from 40 to 48 points. Only on two occasions did he fail to reach the 20 point mark. Overall, Pierre Jackson finished that season with a points per game average of 39.8, the second highest mark in CBA history. He also shot a strikingly efficient clip of 48.3% and he managed to maintain that while attempting upwards of 25 shots a night. Routing out his stat line, he was at about 9 assists and a little bit more than 2 steals per game, and he also splashed home 154 threes. Looking to build on what he had done previously, Jackson signed with the Shenzhen Leopards, but that partnership fell apart after just 2 games and Jackson decided to again come back to the United States as he earned a gig with the South Bay Lakers. Jackson played well against stiff competition, averaging almost 21 points and 6 assists, but unfortunately, another call-up eluded him. Most recently, Jackson has seen action with Galatasaray, a team in the Turkish Super League. Thus far, he's appeared in 7 games and averaged about 19 points and about 9 assists as well. It's increasingly difficult to speculate about Pierre Jackson coming back to the NBA. There hasn't been any news about it. He hasn't been associated with any rumors, and it's entirely possible that he really has no interest in returning to the NBA at this point. I mean, he's built a relatively decent career off of gallivanting around Europe. His time in Asia has treated him quite well, and we've seen that happen with a lot of NBA guys. You know, it doesn't work out the first time around in the NBA. They go over to the Euro League, they play some you know, play some ball over in Asia, the CBA, wherever. And then as they get a little bit older, you know, 31, 32, 33, they come back to the States as teams look for a veteran presence on their team. That could be the route that Jackson goes. But even if he doesn't return to the NBA, he is still a one, a professional athlete. He's managed to make it as a professional athlete and two one who's managed to carve out a relatively decent career and if he wanted to continue that overseas the more power to him thank you guys so much for coming to hang out with me during this one if you could leave a like if you liked the video greatly appreciate it you can also leave a dislike if you didn't like the video go ahead and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this as always everything i'm associated with will be down in the description below and once again I thank you guys for coming to hang out and I'll catch y'all in the next one.